tales of possession have endured since ancient times, warning the faithful of what may happen to their souls if they turn towards sin. But while most possessed souls are inhabited by a demon, this phenomenon of Judaism shows just what happens when one restless spirit takes up residence in another. This week's episode is The Dibbuk. Up, bump in the night, your heart fills with dread. Probably a murderer who wants you dead. It could be a ghost, a demon, or worse. Perhaps you're the victim of a witch's curse. It's hopeless, you're doomed. You'd call a priest if you could. You'd rather just listen to who? Sinisterhood. I'm gonna kill you. Uh, are you a Post Malone fan? <laughs> Actually, I could not have told you a song by him, but the other day. Paris was driving and he played some hits, recent hits, and one of them was Post Malone. I was like, what is this? And he's like, it's Post Malone, don't you know? Did not know. Which song was it? I I can't tell you. I know a couple. There's um, the Spider-Verse movie. There's a couple in there. Um, But if you gun to my head to name three Post Malone songs, I, I don't think I could. No, I could. No, no. I could definitely pick him out of a lineup. Of I think so. A thousand people, though. <laughs> Three people to a thousand. This is he's a very you, unique looking individual. I was just say he's one of those people that you have decided that you are never going to be anonymous. Like at this nope. point, like yeah. I think I, you know, I could probably blend into a crowd. You know, comb my hair down, put on a little, even like a glasses, mustache, Groucho Marx kind of thing. I could probably hide. But even even with that, you're going to see this guy's face tattoos. Oh, yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. He's not he going is, anywhere. He's also from Grapevine. Oh, look at that. A local that, hero. Uh, yeah, he is. Grapevine's own. The um, probably most controversial thing to come out of Grapevine. Otherwise, I, I it's would just say. wine. And I rode an antique train from Grapevine once. Yeah, I lived in Grapevine for many years. It's quite, It's a wonderful city. It's lovely. It's quite yes, lovely. It is lovely. It's, it's uh, got a lot of great parks. Yeah. Yes. It's uh. It's got vineyards over there, right? From what it I does. remember, I worked at several of them. Yes. Oh, there okay. Are, there are lots mm-hmm. of vineyards. I worked in the wine industry for throughout college, and then even from like two thousand eight to for a couple years, where I went back and worked for them. So, would you consider yourself a connoisseur of great wines? I know a lot about wine. For uh-huh. someone who does not drink wine. Fascinating. But I, but, I mean, when I worked in the industry, I enjoyed wine. But, well, now I don't ever really drink. and mm-hmm. But I will enjoy a glass of wine maybe every now and then. But I would not call myself a connoisseur. Yeah. Like a, you wouldn't choose it. A sommel- sommelier. Mm, well, sometimes. I guess it depends on what I'm eating. Oh, that's true. It may, if now it pairs well. Wine. Yeah, if it pairs well. <laughs> But uh, it it was a very interesting job because I learned a ton about wine. That's it's just a I little was... nugget of Christy and Bo. Mm, I love it. it. Just put another piece of the puzzle falls another in the piece place. Piece of the puzzle. <laughs> There's how many? What? How many? If you were going to be a puzzle, how many pieces are you? Uh, probably a thousand. Thousand, like yeah. A, like a big enough pain in the ass, and then there are probably some missing. If there's a hole in the box, people <laughs> the get fed piece up. Piece is missing, and everyone's like, "God, I almost had it." They get fed yeah. up and give up. Yeah, I think I'm one of those uh, 3D puzzles that's yeah. just like, really frustrating, and you can never get it quite right. But then when you finally do, you're like, oh, "That feels good." You're like, "I will never take this apart." <laughs> do you remember those commercials? Puzz 3D, it's going up. Do you remember that? What is it? A puzzle through a puzz 3D? The puzz 3D. That was like the brand of yes. those puzzles. We have a 3D puzzle, but haven't been able to put it together because Ella will destroy it. <laughs> She's like a, it was, she would be like a Godzilla kind of thing. Or she a would, King yeah, Kong yeah. kind of thing. Yes, what, what's the be, shape of it? It's a Game of Thrones. Oh. It's like the whole, I think it's, you know, I've never even opened it. I want to say it's like um, the intro. If you watch the intro credits, like. Mm-hmm. The 3D stuff of that. I think it's that, but I honestly don't know. It could Dang, also be the intense. throne. I really don't know. It was given to us. <laughs> the throne. Well, um, thrones, games, this Post Malone. Box. Inside of a yeah. box. The puzzle comes in a box. Post there, box. We got, we got there. We got there. We got there. <laughs> 
Let's- yeah. This week, um, we wanted to do something that was kind of fun, but also spooky. And this one's yes. been on the docket for a while. So Someone DM'd us about the, the famous Post Malone video. So that's kind of how we got down this trail. Yes, which I, with with everyone's favorite, Zach Baggins of Ghost Hunters. <laughs> so What good. a duo that is. To be a fly <laughs> on the wall when those two met each other. My God. Malone and, Malone and Baggins. <laughs> That is a buddy cop movie I yeah. might watch, also might not watch. I don't know if I could handle two hours of Zach Baggins. I just watched, uh, what is it, uh, Hobbs and Shaw. Loved it. Was it good? I heard it was funny. I heard it was good. Lovely. I love The Rock, though. We've been yeah. over this. Rock's, rock can do no wrong. No, oh, God, I hope he's doing okay right now. He is. He has. Um, he got a TikTok. It's really cute and fun. He, oh, nice. He, he did a TikTok where his daughter is in his lap and she's very obsessed with You're Welcome, the song from Moana. Uh-huh. And so he's in the background kind of rolling his eyes like, okay, I have to sing it again. And she's just bouncing up and down so happy. Oh, it's very cute. That's so cute. Yeah. He's, the, he's the best. He is. Well, we're talking about the Dybbuk and yes. the Dybbuk box. Yes. Yeah. The famous curse. Well, I'm Christy. I'm Heather. And let's get into it. Before doctors knew what caused certain behaviors and actions, people thought any abnormal behavior could be chalked up to a demonic spirit or possessed soul. In Jewish folklore, the spirit that supposedly caused these actions was called a Dybbuk. Much like the accusations of being a witch in early Christian American and European society, when a woman in Jewish society was accused of acting outside the norm, whether due to emotional, mental, or physical illness, she was often accused of being possessed by a Dybbuk. According to scholar Avner Falk in the book, The Psychoanalytic History of the Jews, medieval Jews believed in witches every bit as passionately as their Christian counterparts. That's just men, I think. It's any Here, religion, any yep. state, any country. <laughs> They're like, she's crazy. She's probably if, got a possessed soul. If anything happens that they don't like, she's a witch. <laughs> she's possessed by a demon. What? She's been bleeding for five days and hasn't died? She's got to be burned at the stake. There's, it's, it was, what a, I mean, I want to say what a crazy time that was, but it's still that time, just different. <laughs> it's just different, yeah. Women are friend... still called crazy all the time for doing things that, if men do, are totally fine. I always, my friend just got Bumble and she started dating and she said that one of the guys she chatted with goes, oh yeah, I had an ex, but she's crazy. And I was like, <sighs> when they say that, you got to ask yourself, yeah. what, d- what did he do to her? Yeah got bumble recently she just downloaded it she's been refusing to do online dating so she just downloaded it well my question is because i was wondering this the other day are people dating right now they're like chatting and like face so i guess you could stuff. chat yeah but they're not yeah. like hopefully not meeting up to no go on i think actual some, dates. some people have done like where you stay in your car and they stay in their car but this it's just like all facetime now because it's like, what are you going to, even if you meet someone in the car, you have to holler at them. It's better to just do the video chat, you know. Yeah. How's it over there? Good. How are you? It's just like, what's the point of this? Man, it's like, well, I was going to say it's like love is blind, but we can all see each other. So it's not True. really like love is blind. You see their picture. But they did say on NPR that it's accelerating relationships. So people that were early in their relationships, it's like making them feel like they're more in love or more together than they oh, are. Oh, that's the Love Island uh, but conundrum. The conundrum and the opposite, though, they're saying that people that maybe wouldn't have necessarily gotten divorced for like years are now like ready to file. Oh, yeah. I mean, it's going to heighten whatever kind of situation you had mm-hmm. going on. But on Love Island, they always say in... In the villa, a mm-hmm. day is like a, a day in there is like a week on the outside. Wow. Because you're just around each other 24 seven and you have no one else to talk to but each other, which is kind of like what's happening right now. We're all in Love Island. <laughs> Man, what a, that's my dream, honestly. <laughs> For all, if, if I could be in that villa right now, like I asked, is the rock okay? <laughs> I, I, every time I see, a celebrity's instagram or anything i'm like i'm not to diminish everyone has their own mental and personal struggles they're going through right now but to have just a beautiful acres and acres of landscaped lawn and pools and tennis courts i'm like it's probably easier to deal with this if you if you're living in a resort 
Yeah. I mean, you and I saw pictures of Oprah's house when we saw her live. Oh, my God. I could, I would never have to leave. Like, it's huge. No. There there are acres. There's, like, a rainforest on site. There's, like, a beach. There's a porch. There's, like, a hangout zone. I mean, it's, yeah. like, you'd be fine. Like, Ellen yeah. was, like, we're all trapped. And I was, like, go, go fuck yourself a little <laughs> bit because you're not really. You're, <laughs> you're trapped in, this... in your several million dollar home mm-hmm. in Beverly Hills. Well, Sounds hard for you. Sounds rough for you. It's, like. No, I have friends that are trapped in New York in like a 500 square foot apartment right. with a spouse. Not and right. not a backyard. Yes, not even a balcony. No, you, like they there's been people taking pictures of others on their roofs because it's like the yeah. only open. You got to get outside, especially if you're in New York. Like you can't just take a nice stroll somewhere. Mm-mm. So unless you have your own confined space to go in, God, that would suck. Yeah. Well, according to Jewish folklore, a dipic is the disembodied soul of a dead person that clings to the soul of a living person. Supposedly, the dibbit cannot cross over to the other side and leave the host body until it has accomplished its goal. According to the Jewish Chronicle, the other side, or Sitra Akra, is the domain of evil, where demons have free reign. In Hebrew, the verb for adhere or cling, as one does to God, mirrors the word for dibbit. The faithful are supposed to cling to God, and when they don't, the mirror image is that their soul is inhabited by a dibbic. The word dibbic is a shortened form of a Hebrew phrase, meaning a cleavage of an evil spirit. That's spooky. Mm. I don't want anything clinging to me physically or spiritually. Yes, I'm. You don't like people touching you, really. Correct. That is demon, true. Demon or not. You don't demon want. Demon or not. <laughs> Externally or internally, I do not want to be touched. That's true. I don't want to be clung to. Although Dybbuk's can possess both men and women, according to the Jewish Chronicle, they most often targeted women, penetrating their bodies in a sexual fashion and illustrating the doctrine of opposites, living versus dead, good versus evil, man versus woman. See, again, why does it have to be a sexual thing? Why do I got to get injected? (laughs) Well, and then when we get to how these get out of the body, it's very, (laughs) (laughs) yeah. To think of how it's getting into the body and then how it comes out is is mind boggling. A uh, little little clickbait teaser for you. It's not what you would expect. <laughs> no, it's not. <laughs> Early mentions of the Dybbuk date back to the 16th century. In 1602, the spirit of a dead sinner on the run from persecution avoided being sent to the other side by inhabiting the body of an otherwise moral young man. The Dybbuk then caused the possessed man to turn his back on his prior good ways and begin acting immorally. It wasn't until S. Ainsky's play, The Dybbuk, premiered in Warsaw, Poland in 1920, that the spirit got more mainstream attention. Although religious texts had previously written about possession by a demon, the Dybbuk was the first example of possession by the disembodied spirit of another person. The uh, plot of this play was that a young lady was like falling in love with the guy. He passed away. So she had to get another suitor. But then the spirit of her former suitor took up residence in her body and they had to like perform a ritual to get it out of her. And then she ends up dying, too. And then this is a play from the 1920s. So spoiler alert. And then they go off into the new realm together. But it was well, like, in the end, it worked out for them then. I guess, That's you good. know what? Eternal love. Oh, except for the guy that was like very ready to marry her and is like, what's, why are you acting weird? Oh God. And now you're dead. That did not go well for him. But it's a, this play is very important in Jewish like, literature and theater from the 1920s on. And it, it's been redone as like movies. They've redone it as musicals, as operas. So it's, it's a story that gets retold and retold, um, throughout. And it was kind of the first, I guess, you know, mainstream we- attention of the Dybbuk. That's true. In the book, Tree of Souls, the Mythology of Judaism, Howard Schwartz includes an account of Dybbuk possession. The Dybbuk spirit itself was that of a man whose bad behavior in life had caused his spirit to be unable to cross over. In life, he broke up a marriage and fathered a child with another man's wife. The man then died in a shipwreck before he was able to confess his sins and absolve himself. After his burial, when all the funeral goers had left, an angel came and opened his casket with a fiery rod, then took him to a place called Gehenna, a destination for the wicked. However, the man was refused entry and was instead condemned to be dragged around earth in chains, tortured by three angels, until the death of the child he fathered with the married woman. 
That's a. I wonder if it was Charlie's Angels. Yeah, there's three of them. There's three of them. You don't know. Uh, and it sucks for him that he has to then wish for the death of his own child so he can be free. That's a a Sophie's choice choice situation right there. Yeah. Yeah, Yeah, Gehenna is what Christians know as hell. They're kind of uh, synonymous in that way. There's also, I think it's Slipknot has a song called Gehenna. Yeah, found all this out on YouTube today. Were you a big Slipknot fan back in the day? No, I was not. I cannot say I was a Slipknot fan. Did, Don't think ones? I could name one song apart from the one I just named. I could uh, pick one of them out of the lineup. Didn't they wear masks? I may be wrong. Did I thought they? they wore. I thought they wore spooky masks. Guar? Oh, Guar? They, they dress up in costumes. <laughs> yeah, that was crazy. I'm kidding. I know it wasn't Guar. I think Tommy would know. I think Tommy yeah. was in. He was probably into Slipknot at one point. Mm-hmm. I don't know if they wore masks. That wasn't, um, believe it or not, I was not a big Slipknot head. Not back in the day? What was like no. your high school go-to song, like high school go-to bands? Oh, man. I was just thinking about this the other day uh, because I think I was at the grocery store and some like 90s pop came on. I was like, oh, this song was a jam back in the day. I want to say it was, uh, oh, crap. What What is it? Um, If you're gone. Baby, it's time to go home. Oh, yes. Is that, I know the song. Who, who's that? Ma- uh, Matchbox 20? Matchbox 20. Matchbox 20. There, an album came out when I was a junior that was so good. And every time I hear that album, it, it takes me back there. I was also embarrassingly big into Dave Matthews Band. Oh, <laughs> which man. Is so douchey. But back then, <laughs> it was like the band to be into. I've seen Dave Matthews maybe more than any other band I've seen in my life. No way. <laughs> oh, dude, I saw them so many times in high school. I saw them like four or five times in high school. Them and Bob Schneider, because he's from Texas and he used to play every freaking weekend somewhere. So see him. Yeah. yeah, also a douchey band, a douchey singer to be into. But <laughs> um, yeah, I also, uh, I was very big into like musical theater. So I liked, oh, yeah. I liked all that stuff a lot too. Same. I was a, I was a theater kid in high school. Same. <laughs> what about you? Uh, I love John Mayer, and people were like, oh, John Mayer's nothing more than a new Dave Matthews. And I was like, well, now I have to listen to Dave Matthews' band. So I went to CD Warehouse, got some old <laughs> CDs, and got very into Dave Matthews' band. Yeah. I was like, I'm oh, cool, you guys. I like Under the Table and Dreaming. Under and the I, Table and Dreaming was a great album. And Gray Street, I was like, this song is like my soul. That <laughs> one was later. Yes, that, that one was a later one. Yeah, Under the mm-hmm. Table and Dreaming. And, oh, I can see the cover of the album in my head. It's like a flower and half of it's blue mm-hmm. and half of Crash. it's white. Is that what it was? Was that well, Crash? Just, the Crash Into Me is on that album. I think the album's called Crash. Okay. Yeah, that one was great. But if I heard a Dave Matthews song, I'm immediately back junior year of high school. When it, I love it when it's... <laughs> I mean, it's just... It gets it's you. great. Yeah. Ants Marching, great song. So I'm, good. The, and I was thinking about this the other day because I was driving around. I'm like... I should put on some Dave Matthews right now. Hell yeah. <laughs> but I didn't because it's, it was like, a whole thing. I got I a new to phone relax. and I don't have Bluetooth in my car. Oh. And it's a whole re- thing that I can't because I don't have a headphone jack on my phone now. Oh, no. It's a whole thing. It's a whole thing. I'm going to have to get a new car. Just kidding. I'm getting an adapter <laughs> to, <laughs> to work. But I really do need a new car. But who can get a new car right now? No, you can't. Unless you go to Carvana and get out of the the car machine. That's what and I they just they just send it to you? Yeah. Well, the man reasoned his only means of escaping this torture was to possess the body of a living soul. He first tried possessing a rabbi, but was flung out by a flock of impure spirits that the rabbi invoked to drive out the dibbuk. Next, the dibbuk tried possessing a dog, but the dog didn't take well to possession and apparently became so crazed that it ran until it dropped dead. Finally, the man found a widow and took up residence in her soul. Well, that's a rule of threes that I'm not a fan of. (laughs) It's, he's heightening. <laughs> Although I do like that the rabbi I- invoked a flock of impure spirits. You've that's got like, to. That's a good, uh, good crew to have on your side. Yeah. During the exorcism to save the widow, the Dybbuk told the rabbi that he was able to enter the widow's soul because she had little faith and did not believe that the waters of the Red Sea had truly parted. When the woman swore that she did believe it and repeated that belief to the rabbi's present, The Dybbuk flew out of the woman's pinky toe on her left foot. Well, there it is, everyone. There it is. They go in through the vagina, out through the toe. (laughs) Out through the toe. 
do are we certain that they always enter through the vagina or can Not they just always. attach to you? I think well, I mean, they just attach to you. That could be said of anybody, am I right? I um I well cuz also they attach I mean they've attached to men as well. So I think it's yeah. just a penetrative it's penetrative. So maybe like if your soul is where your heart near is near your heart or your guts, I don't know. They somehow I mean it's a ghost man, they can go through guts. Do you know I didn't know until probably the last 10 to 15 years that your heart isn't on your side where you put your hand. It's kind of in the middle, right? Yeah, yeah. It's like in the middle of your body more. I only knew that because of Pulp Fiction when I was a kid and they stabbed the needle down into her heart. Mm -hmm. It kind of stabs it right. It kind of the middle-ish. I only know where the appendix is because when Uncle Jesse had appendicitis on a Full House episode (laughs) and he had to go to the hospital and he was wearing a Fred Flintstone costume and I distinctly remember him putting his hand over the side of the costume where his appendix was i didn't drink in high school because dj got caught with beer and uncle jesse was so sad with her and i was like i don't want to get you don't want to be uncle jesse no man those teaching moments in those 90s sitcoms were so good yeah the lights would get dark and the the music would be like and And there were always like they'd be like like i vividly remember an episode of Oh my gosh, it wasn't the one with Willis. What was the other one that was like Willis? With the rich white guy that adopts uh like an different urban strokes? city different strokes. Yes. I remember the molestation episode of Different Strokes. I do not. And it was always like but they were that's how they taught kids. Like Yeah. I distinctly and, remember when Cherry on Punky Brewster yes. got stuck in the refrigerator. refrigerator yes. yes, I think about that episode all the time. But can I just say, I never got in a refrigerator. Hell no. When I was playing hide and seek because I was like, I know what happened to Cherry. She almost died. Yes, so she did. It, these these 90s sitcoms did their job because I did. didn't drink and I did not uh, climb in a refrigerator. No, not at all. You t- and you turned out great. Yes. Yeah, there were some. There was also a different strokes one about uh, eating disorders. There were always like really. Heavy. heavy but uh, you know what do shows still do that are there like, shows that like teenagers watch that are like wholesome like a uh, full house or something that teach i don't know i'm not i'm too old and ella's too young so yeah, I don't i'm not know, hip I don't... enough yeah. maybe uh <laughs> or you're well, too maybe hip i uh, maybe like disney channel shows but oh, i don't know that's what's true. currently i bet there's um, i bet there's like stuff like that addressed on those types of shows yeah i'll have to start watching them <laughs> I need I need some of that back in my life. <laughs> I need some lessons. I need some good wholesome lessons back in my life to make me feel good about stuff. Well, later the rabbis checked the widow's mezuzah, a small wooden casing that contains biblical verses written on parchment and is usually affixed to a doorpost. When the rabbis opened the mezuzah, they saw that it was in fact empty, meaning that the dibbuk was able to enter her home and her body. So she's learned a lesson here. You can't be, you have to follow the rules. The rules are, you know, faithfulness, cling to God, put the mezuzah with the proper parchment in it. Don't let your husband die. Do, step one. <laughs> Keep that man around so Keep the dipic doesn't get you. Ladies. <laughs> Much like a demonic possession in Christianity, to rid a possessed person of a dibic in Judaism, holy leaders must perform a ritual. According to the Jewish Chronicle, a group of 10 men who purify themselves through fasting and other rituals dress themselves in the same white shrouds in which a body would be buried. A rabbi would then address the Dybbuk spirit directly and order it to leave the host body. Similar to the exorcism movie. Yes. Yeah. This is all very, yes. Judaism has theirs. Christianity has theirs. I imagine most religions have a story like this. Cultures and religion. Yeah. I would say even mm-hmm. if it's not a religion. According to Rabbi Abraham Bronstein from the Hampton Synagogue, The core of the ceremony itself is essentially a negotiation in which the exorcist addresses the spirit directly, demanding that it leave its host and the spirit stating its reasons for remaining. The rabbi conducting the ceremony would invoke divine names, sound a shofar, a ram's horn trumpet, and open an ark to reveal holy Torah scrolls. All of this done in an effort, according to Rabbi Bronstein, to create a heightened atmosphere of tension and danger, as well as a holiness that the spirit could not tolerate. The rabbi concludes, In the end, the spirit would be forced to leave the host, preferably through a toe, and be restricted from further nefarious activity. 
I don't know. The toe thing gets me. It's great. I mean, it's, you know, if they're going to blow a hole in your body, pinky toe is a great way. I guess that's the least, um, the, the, the nicest way to leave. The it's least a, thing that can be affected. And it's a, it's far away from important stuff like your head and your heart yeah. and your butt even. I yes. Mean, it's it's close-ish, but... And if you uh, need your... You don't really need your pinky toe. So if something That's... were to happen to it, it's not like you can't walk anymore. Your whole life is going to be upended. Your balance is going to be all off if your pinky toe gets cut off by a street sweeper. <laughs> Perhaps, um, yes. Perhaps um, the Dybbuk is getting a bad name. It's, you know, it, I like that the rabbis give it an opportunity to mm-hmm. state its reasons to remain. Like, yeah. why are you here? Just hear me out, you guys. They're negotiators. That's what it sounds like. They're hostage negotiators, essentially. Es- essentially, yeah. <laughs> this person is being held hostage by the Dybbuk. I wonder if there's ever an, a story where the Dybbuk states a good enough reason for it to be possessing that person. That the rabbis go, you know what? You're right. We'll They're see like, you oh, later. And they just sorry. Leave. Sorry, victim. That's a really good reason. It's a I think really good because reason. I think that the ultimate winning argument, though, is God. And so no matter what mm. reasoning they have, the rabbis are still like, you got to get the hell out of here. So they're just being polite by letting him state his <laughs> sure. his business. But they know they're going to kick him out regardless. The, the decision's been made. Spotting a Dybbuk may not be simple, as Dybbuks can take on several forms and cling to the souls of humans and animals alike. According to some, Dybbuks can also be captured inside of objects, like the case of the Dybbuk box. In September of 2001, a man named Kevin Manis, who owned an antique store, put an object up for sale on eBay. It was a wine storage box, purchased by Kevin from a woman in an estate sale in Poland. He was told that the box was a family heirloom, but when Kevin attempted to return the item to the family, he was told by the woman's granddaughter that the family had no interest in taking it back. For as long as the grandmother had it, the box was kept hidden away so that no one could open it and accidentally unleash the spirit inside. Kevin was told that there was a Dybbuk inside and that the entity inside the box was a word translated to mean playful spirit. Well, it's well, wanted. <laughs> it's that's, wanted and cursed. I think that's um, when you look at like a real estate listing and they're like, this cozy cottage you're like it's a shack it's a ramp it's, shack. A, it's a shanty yeah, it's just, yeah. that's just yeah. nice marketing we're they're putting a spin on this if you will they're like totally walkable you're like on a dangerous intersection <laughs> yes. where there's a thousand cars yeah yeah i think that's a bit of a, but i do like that he was buying an antique and that oh well this they may this may be emotional for them we should try to give it back and they're like go fuck yourself yeah, yeah. no no we do not want that a playful spirits mm. inside also if they're trying to pass it off as a playful spirit, there's red flag number one. Like, well, why wouldn't you want that back if it's yeah. playful? And you've had it your whole family. And it's like, nope, not that kind of playful. Now, curiosity eventually got the better of Kevin, and he decided to open the mysterious box. Inside were two pennies from the 1920s, a lock of blonde hair tied with a cord, a little statue engraved with the word Shalom, a small wine goblet seemingly made of gold, a singular dried rosebud, and a candle holder held up by four ornate octopus-shaped legs. I mean, okay, overall, well, this it's a is grab creepy. bag. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's a grab it's bag. Like a it's a creepy grab bag. <laughs> if I open that, if I mean, as soon as I see the hair, I'm out. Yeah, one one of those things yeah. being in the box is creepy, but all of them together. <laughs> oh, the only thing if I saw in there. No, honestly, everything, if I opened that, would creep me out, even if it was just one item in there. Yeah. Also, but you know- Put it together, yeah. It's wooden, and it's old, so when you open it, it's got that, like, old spooky smell. Yeah, and like, it creaks. Mm. It's like- yeah. I hope it's just two little pennies. It's, like, still <laughs> freaky, still creepy. <laughs> yeah, all of that's creepy. According to an interview with KTVO News 3, Manus decided to store it in the basement of his furniture refinishing shop and didn't think more of it. That is, until in his absence one day, the box caused a customer to go berserk. His employee called Kevin, hysterical and crying, saying someone was smashing items and swearing. When Manus returned, he found the employee gone, the basement wrecked and stinking of cat urine, and every single one of the lights in the basement busted out. I mean, it sounds like a human-sized cat got trapped. I was going to say... I've oh, had a, I was going to say owned a cat. I didn't own her. We adopted no. her. She owned us, quite frankly. 
uh, that's just a cat. Yeah, that's, that's just a <laughs> fucking cat in your basement <laughs> doing what it wants. If those lights are hanging, you're asking for it. That yeah. cat will knock that out. Pisses everywhere. I swore and smashed shit all the time because of our cat, because <laughs> stuff she would do. <laughs> this is just a cat. Uh, 100%. <laughs> God rest her soul. Our, our sweet Cleo. Well, unfazed, Kevin cleaned up the box and decided to give it to his mother as a birthday gift. I'm sorry, what? <laughs> This is such a crazy part of this story. What son is like, you know what? I, I don't know. It's fine. Do First you of think, all, even if it's not creepy, why the hell would your mother want this? I if say, I gave this to my mom, she'd be like, what the fuck is this? What do I do with I, this thing? What am I supposed to do with it? That's the question. <laughs> my question is, do you think that he was like, oh, mother will love this box? Or it was like her birthday and he was like, oh, shit. I didn't get her anything. And he's like, uh, ooh, box. I'll give her the box. I watched um, a interview slash reenactment show on YouTube. <laughs> I believe the show is called Fear. I will put the link in the show notes. And it interviews him and then has actors reenacting the whole thing. And by all accounts, he decided he was going to give this to her long before it was her birthday like mother will love this <laughs> mother give it to her yeah and then you know when her birthday is Hall your birth your birthday oh it's oh it's near halloween it's october 28th oh your birthday yeah well, uh, i hope this year i get a dibic box <laughs> no i hope i don't i hope I don't. well uh you can because they sell them on etsy and ebay all the time. E no, thank I you. went down a rabbit hole of people that sell these things. And I'm like, first of all, if you're buying a Dybbuk box from someone that's selling 100 Dybbuk boxes, wouldn't it stand to reason that they can't all be possessed? But you're saying there's a chance. <laughs> that's what everyone's clinging on to. They, they come with um, documentation that this is just for fun. But I watched some unboxing videos of Dybbuk boxes and everyone says, but what if it really is possessed? So it's that excitement of maybe something weird happens. That's It's the excitement of everything haunted. I'm going to get you a Dybbuk box for your birthday this year. Oh, God. Year. Just, oh, no. Just letting, just letting you know. I'm going to bury it in the yard. <laughs> Actually, I'm going to get you a giant cat instead. <laughs> it's the same difference. <laughs> It'll do the same thing to my house. Uh-huh. When Kevin's mom arrived at the shop on her special day, Kevin gave her the box and briefly left the room. Exemplar reports that when Kevin returned, his mother was totally unresponsive, motionless, and crying. When taken to a hospital, they learned she had a stroke and was unable to speak. Kevin then gave her a spell board so she could communicate using letters. When she pointed to the letters, her son saw that she was telling him, No gift. And hate gift. <laughs> That's a bad That's review. A that's a sick ass burn. Hate, hate gift, hate gift. He's like, Mother, I can spell can anything say. on yes. this. Like, yes. I love you. Uh, More I water. <laughs> Not your fault. Hate gift, hate <laughs> gift. Mother, are you spelling out? You did this. Oh no. <laughs> are you spelling out? I regret ever having you. <laughs> oh no. But on the interview, it has the mom. And she is so emotional about the whole thing. She's weeping, recounting mm -hmm. the story. And she said her son gave it to her. She was, she sat down. He had to leave the room. She opened it and she said it felt like a cold breeze just came out of it. And she said she was just like all of a sudden paralyzed and just sank in this chair and couldn't move. And she said she knew she was having a stroke. That's so and scary. One of the employees, um, like, walked by her at that time and was like oh my gosh mrs manis and w ran to get her son and she said she was just thinking am i going to die before my son gets back so i can see him one last time so like she was well aware she was having a stroke but she couldn't move or speak or anything which is a total nightmare it's so scary but she said she just felt drawn to she felt she said she felt like the box was looking back at her Oh, and that it just had this control over her, and and that she was just paralyzed and locked in place. Oh, yeah, and yeah. That's so spooky when you, or not even spooky, like scary to think that an object could have physical, not just you know what whatever you believe uh, spiritually control over you, but something where you look at it and it causes a physiological reaction. Like, I mean, this isn't like I felt like I had a stroke. They had to take her to the hospital. She legitimately yeah. did have a stroke. I have a theory about why. We'll okay. get to later. 
Kevin continued to try giving the box to various family members. Kevin, you son of a bitch. <laughs> why is Kevin just burn it? Why why is anybody nobody? Put it wants out on the curb on bulk trash day and they will pick it up and take it yes. in the dump. Well, each time the family members returned it. His brother told him it smelled of jasmine flowers, while his sister reported the smell of cat urine. Even when he sold it to unrelated parties, they inevitably brought the box back. Kevin told KTVO News 3 that he came back to the shop one day to find the box returned, with a note saying, This has a strange darkness about it. That's one way to return it. He's like, you do just... you have the receipt, though, because I need proof of purchase within 30 days? And this box looks like it would, it's not terribly large. It it's, was originally a wine box. It looks like it would probably hold, like, two bottles of wine in it. So it's not... Like, it's this giant thing that would be cumbersome to get rid of. Just set a match to it. Yeah. So it out. all these problems. Whether inside his house or in a storage unit, the box brought unsettled feelings. Kevin suffered from nightmares involving... An old hag that beats the living hell out of you. As well as the smell of cat urine permeating any space where the box was kept. Eventually, he managed to sell it on eBay to a student in Missouri named Yosef Nietzsche. Yosef later sold the box once he and his roommates suffered from insomnia and illness, according to Exemplor. Well, that sucks for his roommates that he's like, hey, guys, bought something off the Internet. Maybe it's cursed. Anyway, <laughs> putting it in the family room. And they're like, what? We all feel like shit, man. Get rid of <laughs> we your haven't fucking slept in days. Why are but you also... bringing cat piss box in this house? <laughs> First of all, uh, we're said no pets allowed and all i smell is cat piss so which one of you brought a cat in the house it's like it's the box what is wrong with kevin though all of this stuff is happening he's getting sick he doesn't want it and then he sells it to someone that's bad karma man and it's true and i mean i guess unless he told him hey this is haunted and will make you sick and it definitely smells like piss and someone's like sign <laughs> me up well then in that case yeah he he's he's free yeah Jason Haxton, a museum director also in Missouri, bought the box from Yosef for a price of $280. Haxton consulted experts from all areas of expertise to assist his understanding of the box. Supposedly, Haxton experienced both bad and good reactions from having the box, including welts and hives, as well as an anti-aging effect. He was worried that the box was coated in cyanide when he first acquired it, as he and his wife experienced a feeling of illness. Haxton told KTVO News that he believed that there is a source of energy that can be explained scientifically as well as spiritually. So I think this might be one of the reasons why it makes people sick. I think maybe it was coated in some some kind of chemical and that, yes, like cyanide or because cyanide has a sweet smell to it, which uh... like jasmine flowers. Or a cat just pissed all over it, and that is enough to make anyone nauseous and sick. <laughs> I the like smell that of cat pee is the worst smell he in the world. Sold it. It's so, it makes you so sick. I, the it's stench the of it. Especially like yeah. a boy, unfixed male cat. It's oh, so bad. It just sprays everywhere. Yeah, that's yeah. terrible. But the $280, I imagine it was $300, and he like negotiated. Because <laughs> that's such a specific number. And you know yeah. the guy's like... It's I'm hard set at 300 and then he's like, well, doesn't it smell like cat piss and also cause like rashes and... All right, the best I can do is 280, man. <laughs> All right, sold. Yeah. <laughs> I'll take it. I'd be giving that thing away. That's what I'm saying for 200. He but was I guess... giving it away, and then everybody just kept returning it. Then he, I guess he paid, because it says he sold it to Yosef, so Yosef had to pay some amount for it, so I guess he was trying to recoup his, his costs. Maybe. I think you just bite the bullet on that one. Yeah, I was going to say. Dump it in the ocean. As my, gran my mom said, my grandma would be like, if you go, I have a headache, do you, and you should go, do you want some Tylenol? And if you said no, she'd be like, well, I guess you don't have that bad of a headache. Yeah. So it's like, man, the box made me an, an insomniac and made me sick, but uh, I didn't just give it away. I waited to sell it. It's like, I guess it didn't make you that sick. Exactly. She would have just gave it out. Yeah. Well, Haxton finally sold the box after he couldn't contain its powers. For a time, he kept it inside another specially carved box lined with 24 karat gold. He then buried the box in a military-grade container on his property, but later reasoned someone with more expertise should own the box. Haxton then sold the box to Zach Baggins, host of TV's Ghost Adventures, who wanted to showcase the box in his museum of haunted items in Las Vegas. 
I feel like when Zach Baggins walks onto the scene, it's just like Limp Bizkit starts playing. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Decked out in, you know who starts playing is Slipknot. Yes. You, Zach Baggins <laughs> could tell us every single one of Slipknot's albums beginning to end. The, the entire B-side. catalog. Let me tell you the B-side <laughs> of this album. It's extra good. Yes. Oh, man. He could also um, sell you 1,000 Affliction t-shirts if you so <laughs> desired. I got a band full of them in the back. They're still new inbox because I got them from the printer in the boxes. I was going to go through them all in the next month, but I uh, could sell a couple. The Haunted Museum in Las Vegas contains items that Zach claims are haunted, including a doll called Peggy that has caused people who look at her to have heart attacks. There are paintings by serial killer John Wayne Gacy, as well as a room of celebrity deaths that include artifacts such as a chair in which Michael Jackson died. Some find the museum fun, while other reviewers call the museum simply one gimmick after another. Explaining that the experience is uncomfortable and offensive in many ways. However, that doesn't stop visitors from heading to the museum to see the Dybbuk box. This isn't up my alley. No. I don't I don't like murderabilia or anything like that. I find it tacky. Yeah, and that's what they said in the celebrity death room. There's like the Polaroid that the cop shot of Chris Farley whenever they mm. found his body and stuff like that where I'm like, it's like, yes, they're celebrities, but it's like, that's a human being. That was yeah. someone's friend, family member, loved one, and it's just kind of shitty to exploit it. In the worst moment of their life, which yeah. turned to then death. And you're, yeah, you're exploiting it for Nobody, morbid curiosity it, and financial gain. 100%. And it's just sad. Even, and like Michael Jackson, he was a sad person who was addicted to drugs. Like, that's a sad way to die. He has, pro- there's problematic things about Michael Jackson's yeah, life. he was also a child molester. He was, he was a child molester. But he, it's like the human dignity of death, you know? Yeah. Yeah, I, I agree. And also they said that the that review, which we'll post the links, if you were like curious about the museum but don't want to like go and like patronize it It says that they have little people dressed in like carnival outfits no and it's exploitive it's kind of like the old-fashioned freak show and it's just like uncomfortable and kind of like you said kind of like tacky yeah that stuff makes me super uncomfortable yeah the box is kept in a glass container so that no one can touch it before being let into the room with the box visitors must sign a waiver and receive verbal instructions on the dangers one such visitor rapper post malone visited the museum in June of 2018. He signed the waiver and heard the instructions. Nevertheless, in video footage obtained by TMZ, Zach showed Malone the box without the normal protective casing. As Zach stands with the hand on the box, Malone grips Zach's shoulder. The two stand a bit closer to the box. Then Malone becomes visibly spooked by something, and the two quickly leave the room. You know, if it's on TMZ, it's real. That's my mom's only source of news. I will say right now... Nancy is TMZ is a legitimate source of news. They, they are do. they're trash people who have no morals or ethics, mm-hmm. but they do report the truth. And as you say, they won't. And that Har- Harvey Levin is that his name, the main guy. I mean, he's a lawyer, and he's like, I'm not going to get sued if we don't have. I mean, if we have definitive proof of something, then I'll report it. But yes, they they can be also exploitive. But yeah, this the, footage, uh, their show is is not the best. I love whenever uh, they do. Is it who is it that does? I know the sketch. I yeah. think it's Pete Davidson, isn't it? Or is, is it? No. It's a couple of them. I was going to say, Eric Andre plays one yeah, guy. Yeah, Eric Andre and, plays a guy. Yeah, the, the, sketch, the sketch version of it is so funny. It's, it's so good. It's so spot it's so on. Good. Yeah. Um, but yeah, this footage, this footage, because Post Malone never touches the box. Zach touches the box. Right. And Post Malone touches his shoulder. So according to some, that is sufficient contact being in the room with the box to get him cursed. Zach was a conduit, if you will, yes. from the box to yes. Post Malone. Or have we investigated the possibility that Zach himself is cursed? <laughs> and if you touch him, your yeah. life is ruined. <laughs> I think Zach is the one. The box, again, not to be blamed. Zach is the one that cursed Post Malone. Maybe. Or Post Malone, Post Malone didn't even touch Zach. He touched the Affliction t-shirt. And that's why oh. he's trying to sell him out of the van in the back. because That's cursed. what it is. Yes. Coated in cyanide. Out of his 
dungeon. I went down a Zach Baggins <laughs> when you sent me that rabbit today, hole on YouTube today. <laughs> I was on. I was walking the dogs. Christy sent me a link. We'll put it in the show notes. It has nothing to do with the show, but it's a, it's a video of a day in the life of Zach Baggins, and it's a situation where I'm like walking the dogs, and there's like a lady on her porch, and I just turned it on. And I started laughing out loud so hard. She was like, "Sounds like you're having a good walk," and I was like, "Lady, you have no clue." <laughs> you're like, "Why do you come watch this?" Uh, just kidding. You have to stay six feet away from me. Yeah, I know. It's um. It, I'll, I will post a link because I, like I told you in that text, I was like, I may have stumbled upon the most amazing thing I've ever found. <laughs> most amazing video. He's like, just me hanging out in my dungeon. I was like, I'm sorry. He was, he starts it off by going, I do record, I do a lot of work for ghost hunters, but in between, I work on other projects, namely my passion for creating music. <laughs> and then he goes on to explain how it's like that episode of Friends where Ross finds his sound that summer. <laughs> Yes. <laughs> Except it's uh him communicating with Ghost set to like EDM tracks. Oh it, my is, God. it is wild. It's so I'm cringing just thinking about it. But he legitimately says whoever he may be filming this himself for all I know. But he's like, <laughs> I'm just let's go down to my dungeon and I'll show you some of my tracks. He has a fucking dungeon in his house. He calls it a dungeon. It's a basement. And there's like candles and skulls everywhere. <laughs> It's That's so like when, when a guy's like, do you want to hang out in my loft? And it's a refinished attic. And you're like, this is an attic, not yeah, a loft. Yeah, you're like, this is your parents' attic. Yeah, you live in your parents' attic. You don't live in a loft downtown. You live in your mom and dad's attic. Yeah, so it is. Let me go hang out in my, my cool sound dungeon. You're like, this is a basement. <laughs> Probably I also literally... your mother's house in Las Vegas. <laughs> I thought it was the Vic Burger video because of how it was edited and the sounds. And he goes, you know the sound I love the most? water and then it's just like trickle 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 and i was like what am i watching right now it's so over the top i told you i was like all i want is for christopher guest to write a movie about him and like it just be like super serious oh my god it would be so amazing if it just like spinal tap but for ghost yes. hunters would be my dream come true best, best in show but they're all ghost hunters meeting up at a Love ghost it. hunter convention oh that's so good god damn i wish i knew christopher guest i mean i think about that all the time but this time anyway. i really wish i knew him. i'll tweet him it's fine well this encounter was apparently enough to curse post malone who claims he saw a dark figure that then followed him home from the museum later that year in august after the mtv vma awards the tires of his private plane blew off as the rapper took off for london the plane eventually landed safely, but only a few days after that frightening incident, armed robbers broke into Post Malone's former house, demanding to see him. In September of that same year, he was in a car accident, being T-boned in Los Angeles while driving in his Rolls Royce. Luckily, he survived that incident with no injuries. It's kind of like a final destination for a really rich person. Yeah, He's my got private, a private plane. <laughs> private plane that he was taking to London. Uh, I'm sure that it was a mansion they broke into. Mm -hmm. And then he was driving around his rolls when he got into an accident. They did say that it was T-boned by a Kia, which I felt very bad for the Kia mm, driver. Because you know that is an expensive car to fix, the Rolls Royce. Yes, and that Kia probably... The Rolls Royce are, are tanks. That Kia probably crumpled. Yeah. This series of events led some online to speculate that Malone had been cursed by his encounter with the Dybbuk box. However, Malone himself seemed to have a different answer, as he tweeted... God hates me. In response to all the misfortune. That's fair. Well, I mean, that's kind of in line with the Dibbit curse, though. That's true. If you've strayed from the Lord, it can mm -hmm. cling to your soul. There you go. And also, Zach Baggins has all kinds of fucked up stuff in that place. And it's in a the house that it's in was formerly, like, there's a funeral parlor part to it. So then, like, the structure itself is also cursed. So maybe he touched something else. The spirit falls him into the Dibbit room, and that's when it makes, himself, makes mm -hmm. itself seen. So we can't just probably blame that doll. Peggy yeah. the doll. Peggy the doll. Although they do say that there's like a speaker inside of the Peggy the doll and that the tour guide will be like, Peggy, do you have anything to say? And it'll be like, mer, 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 mer. And people are like, oh, it's like, really? It's a speaker inside of the doll box. <laughs> God. Well, why does the myth of a possessive spirit endure? In his book, scholar Avner Falk postulates that the myth of the Dybbuk was created to control the populace and encourage moral behavior. The legend was most pervasive in close-knit, traditional, and rigid Jewish communities and served the purpose of warning against any unacceptable sexual urges or antisocial and aberrant impulses. 
When a member of that community deviated from acceptable social norms, the person would have an exorcism performed on them to rid the body of the dibbuk, the supposed source of the undesirable behavior. It kind of goes back to the witch thing and any of the religious stuff. Yeah. You, you behave in a certain fashion or else. I knew a girl that had an exorcism <gasps> performed on her by her parents. No, no. She, her, par- her parents didn't perform the exorcism. They called a priest to perform an exorcism on he her. did it? Yeah, she was, she was a little kid. What was she doing that made them, like, just being a kid? I mean, I didn't know her as a kid. I, uh-huh. I heard this story as she was an adult and she recounted it. But, uh, yeah, I mean, I would think she was just acting like a, a rowdy child. Yeah. But uh, to some, perhaps she was <laughs> possessed by a demon. I'm try- I don't have a kid. But I'm thinking unless their head is turned around backwards or their eyes are, like, actually glowing... Probably you could go to like family counseling. <laughs> yeah, that's that's my thing. Or with like an all MD. Things. Yeah, I think these types of things can be very harmful to actual mental health problems because they're just written off as oh they're possessed, they're cursed, they're they're a witch. When no, they're actually suffering from mental health issues, and we're just sweeping that under the rug and not like helping these people, and instead making it be this mystical phenomenon that we aren't going to treat with any kind of medicine or counseling or anything like that. And it's just, it's and, sad kind of when you think about it. Well, and luckily it seems like in the Jewish community, it has gone toward that, that it's not, they don't just yeah. blame everything on the dip, but back in, you know, you're screwed if it's 1850 and you're, oh, yeah. you know, you're suffering from something that there's a no medicine for and b no explanation for, then yeah, that's, well, it's probably they're probably possessed. You're like, yeah. no, I don't think so. I just need help. No. Rabbi Abraham Bronstein from the Hampton Synagogue described the behavior of one possessed by a dibbuk to a popular Yiddish newsletter. The rabbi said, A person possessed by a dibbuk might lose control of their body, falling to the ground in convulsions, weeping or shouting. Sometimes they would act rebelliously, refusing to participate in normal communion or congregational life. Famously, many possessions featured the demons speaking through the host body in a strange voice and even describing faraway events or community secrets that the host themselves could not have known. However, Falk writes in his book, the people who believed themselves to be possessed by a dibbuk and who were treated as such by their families were in fact actually severely hysterical, borderline, or otherwise emotionally disturbed people. Which is true. Oh, yeah. I, mean, I think that's it, yeah. Yeah, and especially, you know, when your family starts to believe it, too, and it, it gets to, to be like a case of almost not like folly I do, but like where everyone starts to buy into it. And so then suddenly it's almost like with the Smurl family with what you kind of saw happening where one person believes it and then they don't have, you know, other family members don't have cause to deny it. And so then every they can they start to find evidence that's not really evident. You know, it's it's yeah. all actually just symptoms of a problem that can't be treated. Exactly. Unlike many myths, there are written accounts of Dybbuk possessions that include dates, names of the possessed, and names of witnesses. However, with the evolution of modern medicine and mental health resources, there have been fewer Dybbuk possession reports. In fact, according to Rabbi Bronstein, When Rabbi Yoel Teitelbaum was once consulted about a possible Dybbuk possession, he recommended a psychiatrist. Even within the Orthodox world, my sense is that, though belief in Dybbuk's in principle may linger, Almost anyone would treat the symptoms a Dybbuk would present in terms of mental health. Well, good for Rabbi Yoel Teitelbaum. Yeah, for sure. I mean, no, it's one of those where you're practicing for, you know, your religious beliefs, but also incorporating scientific, medical, mental health, things like that yeah. in it to be truly a holistic leader, a community leader. Yes, which is absolutely critical in any religion. Mm-hmm. When asked what one should do if they suspect themselves or a loved one is possessed by a Dybbuk, Rabbi Bronstein instructed them to call. A reputable mental health professional. Though, if you are convinced that the situation is more supernatural, Rabbi David Batri, head of the Hashalom Yeshiva in Israel, is the only living person today who claims to have successfully exercised a Dybbuk. Well, I'd like to interview him. No, seriously, to know what it was like and, you know, how yeah. you, I'm sure now, you know, with the modern mental health, uh, you know, what's the word I'm looking for? Like the advances, you would yeah. rule all of that out first and then be like, no, this mm-hmm. really is a spiritual problem. I mean, there's priests that 100% believe 
in exorcisms and that people Mm -hmm. Christian Christians can be possessed and that they've cured them of that. So, you know, I'm not, I'm who am I to say what's right and what's wrong? Oh no, for sure. I mean, as long as somebody's getting the help they need, whether it is mental health help or an exorcism. (laughs) Yes. And you know what? Perhaps the exorcism off maybe it sometimes even acts as kind of like a placebo effect Mm -hmm. cathartic because if if the person that is afflicted honestly believes that because of mental health reasons or whatever that they have been possessed by a demon and then an exorcism is performed perhaps they feel better because they feel like they've been ridded of it that's true well chris french a skeptic and head of the anomalistic psychology research unit at goldsmiths college said that he doesn't believe in Dybbuk's or the boxes that supposedly house them. Instead, he offers a different explanation for the strange occurrences. If you believe you've been cursed, then inevitably you explain the bad stuff that happens in terms of what you perceive to be the cause. Put it like this. I would be happy to own this object. That's kind of like what you were saying about the Smurl haunting. Like, if you're... If you think you've been cursed, then you're going to chalk everything weird that happens to you up to, oh, I must be cursed, and not just coincidence someone get that man a dybbuk box he sounds like he's fine with hey, it. you know what i've got several etsy sellers that i can send to <laughs> you should email him a link just so you know i it. i will so what do we think well poor post malone but it sounds like he's fine now i mean i think things, he's okay now things yeah, are going I think well he's fine now he's he's good now yeah do you think it was just a string of bad luck or did zach baggins have something to do with this i think zach baggins cursed him somehow <laughs> no i mean it's one of those like it, I don't know enough. It's one of those where I don't know enough about the spiritual world to be able to say what is or isn't going on in a place like the Haunted Museum. When you gather things, which I do believe humans give off an energy, and sure. good or bad, positive or negative, that like when you gather such a grand amount of negative things in a place where it's disrespectful of people's deaths there's murderabilia john wayne gacy's paintings things like that that there's such bad vibes going on in there that if you're not careful and you're bumping into stuff and going around touching it then i think something could follow you home or some kind of bad or negative energy could follow you back or is there such a thing as coincidence yeah i mean he visited in june the first bad thing happened in august who knows if bad things happened in between there that were like smaller and got worse or it just so happened that he went with a cut rate private jet company and he should have spent a little more but i think overall the whole concept of the dybbuk is i mean who's to say is demonic possessions real or you know curses real things like that there's in this situation, the Jewish community has kept way better records than any other type because I think the Catholic Church with the exorcisms try to kind of hide stuff, whereas yeah. there are records that say this person, first name, last name, date of birth, was possessed by a dybbuk. These were the people that were there that were in the 10 men that were at the ceremony. Here's the rabbi that performed it, the date, the time, what happened. So there's a lot more records of this happening. So does that mean maybe it's more realistic? And the demonic possessions have just been covered up by the Catholic Church. Oh, or no. they're just better dictators and, and not dictators, <laughs> d- uh, note takers. Yes. Better. Or they're just better note takers. Yes, they're better note takers and keeping records. And hopefully I'm glad that in this, you know, in Judaism, they have now, le- you know, got, turned towards mental health treatment in conjunction with spiritual treatment. And then it seems like, you know, the Catholic Church is pretty much like, we don't have any possessions. What are you talking about? But there are fringe Christianity groups, too, that Paris dated a girl that he goes, yeah, we had to break up because she kept trying to take me to church. And I went to church with her and it was fine. And then they p- performed an exorcism. And I was like, yeah, this is weird. <laughs> I'm not going to go to church anymore. That's, uh, that's a boner killer. It was some like fringe, little, small town, rural, super 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 conservative church that again it's there's no records of that being kept and was that girl suffering from some mental health and was just being mistreated you know by by some ignorant people so i don't know i think that there's definitely spiritual clinger honors whether it's a demon or another spirit and definitely bad energy if post malone was going around fondling stuff in the museum (laughs) yeah i totally agree about the bad energy and when you get all of those things into one area I imagine you walk in and it's just this feeling of like heaviness and and dread. I also, he, Post Malone never came out and said, I think I've been cursed. The internet kind of put this together because that TMZ released that, that video. And so media kind of pushed this agenda like, oh, 
this is probably what happened to just be salacious or whatever. So does Post Malone think he was possessed? No, he thinks God hates him. He thinks God so, hates him. Also, yeah. for, from Zach Baggins' perspective, a person who's marginally famous like Zach Baggins being in a TMZ video with somebody who's a superstar famous like Post Malone is real good. <laughs> it's real, I mean, yes. he's, he's when it says TMZ and, and obtained the security footage, who do you think emailed it to him? Like 100% yeah. it was Zach Baggins yeah. sent that to them. Yes, definitely. From his dungeon. That's what his... <laughs> His, uh, instead of from my iPhone, all of his <laughs> emails just say sent from my dungeon. <laughs> Please excuse me. I would love to typos. get an email from him. <laughs> yeah. Please excuse me, typos. My, uh, my ghost secretary is typing this out. Sent from my dungeon. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to change my signature to say that. <laughs> 100%. 100%. I'm going to change the sinister hood Gmail to yes, say sent from our dungeon. We're going to do that. 100%. <laughs> Oh. oh, that's good. We love providing Sinisterhood to you at no cost. So if you like what you hear, consider supporting the show by donating to our Patreon. We are a small operation, creating the show for you by researching, writing, recording, and producing it ourselves. Any amount is sincerely appreciated and helps offset the cost of making and hosting the show. As a thank you, you'll get some sweet perks like a Sinisterhood sticker, membership to our exclusive Patreon Facebook group for those in the Ruling the Airwaves tier, a special shout out on the show, a monthly bonus mini-sode, and a Patreon exclusive video and audio content like our weekly mix bags where we share three of our favorite things of the week. For more details on specific membership tiers, visit Sinisterhood.com and click on Patreon in the top right corner to join today. And make sure you stick around after our sign-offs to hear your shout-out. So many of you have been tagging us in pictures of you sporting your sweet Sinisterhood merch. Keep those pictures coming. If you want some cool Sinisterhood swag like t-shirts, mugs, totes, and even clothes for your kiddos, visit Sinisterhood.com and click on Shop in the top right corner, including we've gotten good reviews on our brand new Donna Laser and the Meat Warlock shirt with a special design by Day Off. Yes. And for the month of April, 100% of profits from merch sales will go to the World Health Organization COVID-19 Solidarity Response Fund. The best thing you can do to help us grow is like, review, and subscribe on Apple Podcasts or wherever you listen to your podcasts. And please tell a friend who you think would like us to check us out. It means so much to us and really helps small podcasts like us get more exposure. You can follow us on Instagram and Twitter at Sinisterhood Pod and like us on Facebook at Sinisterhood. Christy, where are you at on the computer? I'm on Instagram at Christy M. Wallace and on Twitter at Christy or GTFO. Heather? I'm on Instagram at Heather vs. the World and on Twitter at MCK vs. the World. As always, the devil rules the airwaves. Uh, keep it creepy. Hey, everybody. Thank you so much for supporting the show on Patreon. Here are your special Patreon shoutouts. Jessica Barfield. Kim Halper. Ariel Rose. Ashley W. Sarah Robertson. Michelle Redbear. Mandy Navarro. Kelly Thomas. Rachel Zimmerman. Autumn Harnett. Ellie Latouche. Chloe Schoen. Kristen Nolly. Tristan Krug. Megan Grinnell. Rachel Sliney. Cooking in Crime. Orla Cleary. Julia X. Monique Waring. Susan Wachowski Riker. Courtney DeJoy. Joe Teslick. Casey Whitaker. Patricia Smith. Thank you guys so much for supporting the show. We could not do this without you. We appreciate you so very much. Keep it creepy. Wahahaha. Sinister.